listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and Visa. And I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos. Michael, week seven in the NFL, I think caught a lot of people off guard with some of the results that we had here. But let's start off with Sunday Night Football at the Link Eagles beating the Miami Dolphins 31-17. to This is what we wanted to see from Miami. It's like, all right, when you step up in competition, what is it going to look like? And it didn't look good last night. Well, they're 8-25 and against the, you know, the teams, the combined record of the teams they've beaten are 8-25. and And look, I, I think this is an old school game in the sense of team building, right? You know, all this nonsense about, you know, you got to draft this, you got to draft that. At the end of the day, a defensive front as dominant as Philly has Oh, is always going to neutralize a good offensive team. It's just fact. It's time immemorial. You know, it just goes back to what Tony said sitting there at the meeting. You know, this thing of ours is better than time. You know, it lasts longer <laughs> as time immemorial. Defensive lines dominate the game. That's what they do. If you're good in the offensive and defensive lines, like Philadelphia, you're going to hold uh, this beautifully crafted offense, uh, like the Miami Dolphins, you're going to hold them to 244 yards. I think what, what we saw was, I, I think a lot of yesterday was cause and effect, right? Everybody has a perception about certain teams. You know, Miami's great offensively. Yeah, but what he's been great at doing is hiding a really shitty offensive line. Now, I know he's got backups, but look, if he would put, if he, if, if, if Armstead's in there, they're not any good. If Williams is in there, they're not any good. If Isaiah wins in there, they're not, they're not I mean, the starters aren't elite either. Right, Their offensive line is the weak link of their team. And he's done a great job of manufacturing it and hiding it. But he can't do it against good defensive fronts. And they just took it to him. I mean, they just took it to him. And there was, for all the explosiveness, for all the, you know, I mean, they scored 10 points, Femi. The yep. defense got seven. Mm-hmm. I mean, they only, had, they only had seven first downs in the second half. That's all they had. And 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 Hertz, you know, he turned the ball over twice in a game. You know, I, for me, it's like at some point, you know, this is going to be a playoff type game. This is how teams are going to play Miami in the playoffs. They had eight possessions. You know, they had they forced them to punt three times. They scored. They they turned them over on downs twice. Physicality up front will always win. Yeah, to your point there, Ben Solak over at the Ringer put out this stat. They said that the Dolphins have never scored fewer than 17 offensive points in a game that Tua finished in McDaniels' tenure. Just 10 points tonight, three of which came off of the turnover. Hurts fumbling the football there when he held on the ball pretty long there in the first half. Like It was a complete shutdown of this Miami offense there. Like Tyreek Hill, like obviously he's going to always be dynamic and make dynamic plays. He also probably dropped a touchdown pass in one of those plays there. But it's just like the, the, the Dolphins offense, it feels like – and this has kind of been a theme so far this season, is that when they play a team that has physicality, especially up front, that's when it feels like the offense sort of cowers a little bit or doesn't quite have uh, what they need to go out and be able to to move the ball like they do against the, the Carolinas, the Giants, and the Broncos of the world. Like, when they meet physicality, it doesn't seem like they're up to the task. It's hard for them. It really is. I mean... You know, they can't get all the things that they want to get done. They can't throw the ball in rhythm. And then what Philly made them do is play one-dimensional, right? Philly made them one-dimensional. I mean, for the team that leads the league in yards per attempt, they lead the league in yards rushing. I mean, they've been sensational. They ran for 45 yards in the game. You know, they ran for 45 yards in the game. They only had 12 first downs the entire game. I mean, think about that. I mean, they had 12 first downs in the game. I mean, the lowest they've had all year in terms of first down was 22 against the Patriots and 22 against the Giants. I mean, let's, you know, that Giant game, let's not forget, they turned the ball over three times down there. They were fortunate to beat the Giants because the Giants were so bad offensively. Remember that game? Yeah. I mean, they had 524 yards of offense in that game and only had the ball for 24 minutes. Yet they turned it over three times. So, I, I mean, look, Miami's, they've got incredible skill. They've got incredible, their defense, I thought their defense holding Philly to 99 yards rushing was really good. I thought they played as good as they could play. They created two turnovers. You know, Philly still had 26 first downs in the game. And and I'm not sure Philly played their best game. 
No, but I don't think Jalen Hurts played his best game, and he still had a pretty nice uh, box score there, 23 of 31, 279, one rushing touchdown and two passing TDs. How about A.J. Brown, though? Five straight games with 125-plus receiving yards. Uh, I was watching that game thinking to myself, I was like, man, why didn't Tennessee want to pay this guy? This guy's pretty damn good. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> seriously, I thought the same thing too, Femi. <laughs> Like, I mean, like, you're going to get that in the first round? I mean, <laughs> that deep ball catch he made into traffic was just sensational. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the game winner. It wins the game. I mean, you know, he makes that incredible play. I thought it was an incredible throw. A, a great – with a guy in his face coming right down there. You know, I mean, it, it. look, I mean, Philly is – Philly's hard to play. They're hard to beat. And when, when their skilled players make plays like that – you know, it's even more difficult. But when you hold Philly to a 98 yards, 99 yards rushing, 2.9 yards a carry, you know, you got to feel like you're going to win the game because you feel like, okay, that you made them one-dimensional. For as much as Philly made Miami one-dimensional, Miami made Philly one-dimensional, mm-hmm. only Philly's quarterback was able to make plays and get the ball down the field. I'm sure we're, uh, we're we're back to Greece and polls. I know the Phillies, they won the other night, and we're going to grease some more polls Big night here. tonight, big, yeah. Big night there. Uh, but Jalen Hurts, though, a little concerning, was running with a little bit of a limp. He, he was seen kind of walking gingerly post-game as well there. With, I think he's dealing with a knee injury is what it sounds like. He had a knee brace on. They put on at halftime there. Just a little concerning there for the Philadelphia Eagles. Like If there's any kind of downside to take away on their end, it's the health of their quarterback. Yeah, I mean, look, he's carrying the ball way too much. He's got 74 rushing attempts already this year. I've said this. I think I had a bet with Sal Palantonio that he won't have, I think it's like 150 rushing. I mean, he's going to get, he's got way too many rushing attempts, you know, and and I think to me that's the issue, right? You know, I, I know a lot of those, some of those rushing attempts are on that great quarterback sneak that they have going. But to me, you know, he's carrying it about 10 times a game. What that, that average is 10, you know, over 10 times a game. That's too many. That's too many yeah. where you're not going to get hit. You're not going to pay a price for that. But, you know, he's been able to make the throws that he's had to make. I, I think he's been, you know, for the turnovers, which is un, uncommon for him, he's still been able to, to, to get his team in position to win the game. And I think his ability to throw the football more effectively, especially this year, his bad throws is way down. He's only at 11.7 of bad throws. In terms of when you you know last year he was at fourteen his rookie year is at twenty six in that category, twenty six point seven, but what what I think's happening a little bit is he's not on target as he was last year. Last year he was at seventy eight percent on target. The year before seventy eight percent on target. This year he's at sixty nine. Yeah. So he's just missing some throws. Yeah, maybe we can attribute to that to the to the injury or whatever he's dealing with, but he just kind of seems a little bit off. But when he when he's asked to make plays, he makes them. Like the fourth down that set up the one yard touchdown, terrific play connecting with AJ Brown. You mentioned the deep ball there on the final drive. That final drive was just like uh, watching it. I was like, this is what championship caliber teams do. Up by seven, yeah. mid fourth quarter, put the game away. You saw the tush push, the two tush pushes to convert on fourth down there. One on the twenty five yard line, another one a little bit uh, near midfield there. Then they hit that deep ball. Like that's what the great teams in the NFL do. And you tip your cap to the Eagles. And last point on AJ Brown, our producer Elliot just sent this to me. He has more receiving yards this season than all Titans wide receivers combined. So <laughs> yeah, so we got I mean, that. Not hard to figure out. And the Titans, don't, they might have to play with Malik Willis this week. You, you know, to me, I, I think the, the thing that's underlying here is Lane Johnson played last night on a, on a high ankle sprain, which was remarkable. You know, he gave up. I mean, he Hurts is getting hit more this year than he ever has before. Mm-hmm. You know, the pressure on him has been more than ever. And even though the line's really good, I think they're playing through some injuries with Jurgens not in there at right guard. So I, I think there's a little bit of that. If they get healthy with that, you know, obviously they're going to be a tough team to play. But then they go down to Washington this week. So and then they got Dallas, but they got your Dallas Cowboys before the bye, and then they play Kansas City and Buffalo. Yeah. So, I mean, here's what they got: they got Washington bye, Dallas, Kansas City, San Francisco, Buffalo, San Francisco, and then Dallas, and then out at Seattle. I mean, they, they, when they come yeah. off the bye, they have five hard games. It's a tough stretch. It's a tough stretch. But they're a team that seems like they're up to the test, though. Really good last night there. They've started to play a lot better these past couple weeks than they did in the first month of the season. Let's get to the wackiest game of the day. It was in Indianapolis. Browns and the Colts. Somehow I won my bet with this game. I don't know how. But for Cleveland, they won it 39-38. to I think Indianapolis probably should have won the game based on how it was no. played out. They ran the ball up and down this Browns defense. This is the defense we were all singing praises of all week long, and they made it look like they were just another defense. 
They, they did not deserve to win. They, the, the, the Colts did not deserve to win. I mean, Come deserve, on now. I mean, look at the box score, they, man. They, they just they des- destroyed They, they deserved what they got. And, 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 okay, so why do you think they lost? I mean, it was the... The, the the end of the first half is, is where the game really was like, oh, you can't oh, do the, that. It was the one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. But it, this is a classic example of an offensive coach who still thinks he's an offensive coordinator calling plays. Like he's not transitioned into a head coach at all. You know, and he's sitting there, and, and it's it's disappointing in terms of when you watch this and you see it, you're saying like, okay, let's not make this mistake. But he gives the team – he gives them – forget what Minshew gave them. Minshew gave them points, but the play caller gave them points too, right? All mm-hmm. right, so, you know, here he is, and we'll go over it. I mean, uh, it, it was driving me nuts live. I mean, my man Corey was with me sitting next to me on the couch as I was bitching about the Raider game the entire day. I'm screaming about it. Millie's telling me to shut up. But I'm also watching this Colt game bitching about that too. <laughs> All right, so he gets the ball here. He has the ball with 154 to go. Cleveland has two timeouts. All right? Mm-hmm. All right. Now, he's got the ball at his own 11. So, he, of course, what does he do? Instead of running the ball, instead of running the ball to get the clock moving, he calls a pass. He gets sacked for minus five yards. Shocker, right? Mm. Cleveland calls timeout. Now he got the ball at the six. What's he do now? What's he do now? <laughs> what would you do? Like, you're not going 94 yards on a drive here. On second and 15, like, why not just run the ball? Okay, well, you say, well, we had them doubled over there. If you call that a double, you know, if you call that a double, then I'm a, I'm a swimsuit model. Like, like, seriously, if you call that a fucking double team over there, then I'm a swimsuit model. All right, so, all right, now we give up a sack fumble, seven points. Okay, I just gave you seven, no problem, please take it. But look, I go for it on fourth down, they'll call me a genius, and I'm a great play caller, so Shane's got nothing to worry about. All right, now we get the ball back. We got a first and 10 at the Colt 29. We got a minute 42, and Cleveland still has two timeouts. Okay, we start to drive off. We run the ball. Great call. Great call. We get two yards. No problem. That's okay. We false start. Mm. We false start. We lose five. So now we're at second and 13. Come back. Run it again. Great call. Get timeout. All right. And then third and 11. Mm. We'll go to break. We'll come back. Yeah, and and, and this was just in the first half. We'll get to the second half and the rest of the game on the other side is the GM Shuffle. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Michael, you were just going over the Colts' uh, middle eight, or maybe we yeah. should call it their messy eight after what we saw oh, yesterday. disgusting. <laughs> all right, so now we got the ball third and 13. Cleveland's mm-hmm. used all their timeouts. They've used all their timeouts. There's 130 to go in the half. You are basically, you have the ball at your own 17-yard line. Your own 17. You've got 83 yards to go. They don't have any timeouts. Third and 13, Miles Garrett's on the other side. What do you do? What would you do, Femi? Uh, I, I would not drop back and pass. I would just go ahead and uh, of <laughs> let, course let's, you run, wouldn't. Let's, let's, let's run this football. Uh, just run it and let the clock milk down to where we're under a minute to go and we'll punt the ball and we'll play good defense. And what do we do? We give the Brownies their fourth time out of the day. Mm. We throw an incomplete pass. Why? Because I'm an offensive coordinator. And I, my job is to score points and call get first down. So I call a stupid fucking pass and I go and piss the game away. Meanwhile, everybody in Indianapolis is complaining about the officials. No one's complaining about the sequence of plays at the end of the first half in the middle eight. No one. I, I didn't listen to the broadcast. I don't know if they were or not, but it was really atrocious. It was like, okay, if this is football 101, Shane. You can't do this. You're a great play designer. You're a great offensive play caller. You moved the ball against one of the best defenses in all of football. You deserve praise for that. However, you know you're getting the ball to start the second half, What are we trying to do? Let's go in at halftime. We've already made one mistake. Why make two? As bad as the second and 15 call was that cost the fumble and the the interception, I mean the touchdown, the third and 11 call has to go down as one of the most horrific calls of the day. Give the ball back to him. Give the ball right back to him. And what does Cleveland do? With P.J. Walker at quarterback, right? I mean, think about it. With P.J. Walker at quarterback – They go, and they get the ball back, 
and they have a minute 17 to go. They don't have any timeouts. But as we've seen from Gus Bradley and what he does and what he loves to do is he plays palms or cover four, and next thing you know, you know, we got an eight-yard gain, we got a five-yard gain, we got a nine-yard gain, you know, we got a 12-yard gain, and then we throw the ball to stop the clock, and then we throw a deep ball, and we kick a 54-yard field goal, and we have give up 10 points at the, end of the, at the end of the half. 10. We give up 10 points at the end of the half. The Brownies don't even convert a third down in the quarter. They get four first downs in the quarter, and they get 10 points. And you lose the game 39-38, and everybody's blaming the officials. I mean, it was a disaster class in terms of the end of the first half there. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's just an, maybe it's an inexperienced head coach. Maybe he'll learn this one. But you really don't want to see that because offensively, like you mentioned, really impressive performance against this Browns defense. And the Browns defense got lit up on on like the, the entire day. But Miles Garrett, kudos to him. I mean, he's one of the baddest mofos in the league. Like the two sacks there helped change this game. And while the Browns defense got lit up, like he was probably the player of the game. Also had the blocked field goal as well earlier in the game. Yeah. Like, like he showed why he is a, a game changing player and one of the best in the league. He is. And he, they also show that, you know, we've seen this with Gus Bradley before. We're going to play cover four. We're going to play cover two. And we're going to let PJ Walker move the ball down the field. You know, now look, you can argue that the call on illegal contact, I thought the pass interference call was uncatchable. Yeah. Like, I don't understand, like, whatever happened to the uncatchable rule in the NFL? It doesn't exist Like, anymore. if a ball's not catchable, how can you, you know, but yesterday was a day they were going to call illegal contact. They were determined to call. It was all over the place. Your boy Scott Novak was just loving it all day long in Seattle. No one was happier, wasn't he? He loved it. I mean, who was happier than him yesterday, you know? <laughs> <laughs> nobody R- roughing the nobody passer. Was all, all the, he he was in his bag. <laughs> oh, he loved it. He was so happy. Did, you know? It, it, anyway, but look, it, that, but that's not why they lose. And then when it was fourth and one, did you really think for one minute that they weren't going to run? They were going to put the ball in, in PJ Walker's hands? Hell no. No way. You yeah. knew they were going to throw it. I thought Shane should have used his timeouts during that drive. I thought he did. I don't think he did a good job. I mean, he doesn't use his first time out until 24 seconds left to go in the 28 seconds. He was trying to win it there. Like, I, I think I would have tried to put more pressure on them. They would have, you know, I mean, I would have tried to at least save some time. It's second and 13, you know, when, when it's first and 10, he's got the ball at the zone 19. So let's go through it. After the two minute warning, they run one, two, they, they, they run. He doesn't call any timeouts. They don't call any timeouts, and so he doesn't call it until we get down there. And basically, they ran eight plays. Just let the clock milk down. It was it was rough there, and it's a game that like I I still contest that I think Indianapolis should have won the game, but their coach probably cost them the game at the end of the first half. On the other side, though. What are we doing with this Deshaun Watson thing? Because before he left oh. due to what we thought was an injury, he was absolutely atrocious. Like, like Can he they was, get a refund? Like, I mean, Can the, they get a <laughs> refund on their trade? $230 I mean, million was guaranteed. A, I will stand on the table and say I was a huge Deshaun Watson fan. But I'm not a fan. I mean, I'm out of the club. The, that was embarrassing. Yeah. Like so, the, throws, the, the throws he made in this game – like you could, you know, I think it, like I give Kevin Stefanski credit for saying, "Look, he passed the protocols. I just didn't put him back in there." He's not your franchise quarterback. I know Kevin said, "Well, we don't want to hurt our franchise quarterback." Well, he let me let me let you in on a secret. He's not your franchise quarterback. He had five passes in the game and threw two of them to the other team. It was he only had one interception. I mean, he was a tro. I mean, it was bad. I mean, if he plays, the Colts win easily. Yep. Not that Walker's any good, but Walker at least had 15 compl- – I mean, from the very first pass of the game, it was a disaster. He threw the ball in the dirt like, I don't know what's happened to this guy. Let me ask you this, Femi. What do you think his trade value is in the market right oh, now? My, if I called you up and said, I'll tra- I want to trade for him, what, what do you think it is? I mean, you better be giving me a couple first-round picks as well to go along with it. I mean, with that contract – You couldn't sell oh – I mean, you couldn't sell him for a first-round pick to anybody. <laughs> Nobody's giving you a one for him. I mean, he's on Feline's basement. Rack. No, no, I'm saying, I'm saying Cleveland better give me a two first rounds as well to take that oh. contract. <laughs> I'm like, like, like that contract is absolutely an albatross. Two hundred thirty million guaranteed. He looks, her, like, he looks like a bottom five quarterback in the league. 
And he acts like it too. Like there's no sense of urgency. Like he acts exactly why the owners never wanted to give guaranteed contracts. Because he acts like he's the he he's he, you know, he's the fat cat. Like there's no motivation. They can't cut me. You gotta live with it. Good luck. And yep. the problem is they got a Super Bowl caliber team. They had a bad day defensively. I give you that but horrible tackling. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't tackle they don't tackle Pittman on the long 75 yard run. Catch and run. I mean, Downs has been a really good player for for the Colts. I mean, they gave up 168 yards rushing. I mean, you know, think about that. Yeah, no, they got ran all over. But yeah, the Watson thing. Stefanski came out and said he's going to be the starter uh, this upcoming week here, and I'm sure he had to say that because I think you got to fade him, Femi. Yeah. I think as better as you got to fade his ass. I mean, I, until he proves he can make plays, you got to fade him. Well, they're they're, like, they're they're going to Seattle next week. That'll be a tough place. Yeah, for I him. mean. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I'm we'll gonna, see. Yeah, we'll see with that one. Because he. I looked, mean, there's no value. I mean, you got to be sitting there saying we gave all this up and this is what we have. I mean, it's one thing to be in a bad position, you know, where a lot of teams are without a quarterback, but they didn't give up all the picks to be bad. Like the Denver and Cleveland gave up a bunch of draft picks and haven't improved their quarterback position to where they can go somewhere, to where they think it's going to get them to where they go. They overpaid. So not only are people overpaying for the player in terms of cash, they're overpaying for the trade for the player. Think about the way do we get done tallying the Bryce Young deal? Wait till that deal gets tallied up. Mm. Hopefully Bryce Young turns a corner. I still believe in Bryce. We still believe. but I, I think Bryce Young's going to be a good player, but I don't think when we tally it up, it's going to be worth what they gave up for him. It ain't going to be worth Drake May, Marvin Harrison Jr., and another one. It ain't going to be worth that. No, no. And uh, and DJ Moore as well as part of the deal <laughs> in that deal. Like and DJ him. Moore. Yeah, it's that, that's a tough one there for the Carolina Panthers, who are on the bye this week. Uh, let's get over to Foxborough, where the surprise of the day, I think for most people there, New England Patriots beating the Buffalo Bills 29-25 in this game. Mac Jones played his best game, I think, in about two years. 25 of 30, 272, two touchdowns. Buffalo falling to four and three. Uh, congratulations to Bill Belichick. Becomes the third coach yeah. in NFL history with 300 wins. Uh, an awesome feat there. After the game, they asked him about it. He said, I'm not really concerned about that. We're concerned about the <laughs> season, which, of course, that's what he, he's going to say there. But a hell of an yeah. accomplishment, though, nonetheless, though, as the Patriots have a Sunday to feel good about themselves, at least. The fans, it was good to see the fans actually happy for once. <laughs> Well, they actually played good. I mean, their offensive line, they moved Michael Oluanu out to right tackle. That helped. So played right guard, you know, and they had Strange, uh, Cole Strange back at left guard. They actually played well. I mean, I think, again, we talked about cause and effect, right? We talked about Miami hiding their offensive line. Well, for years, Buffalo has hid their defense. Everybody thinks it's an elite defense, but when they play from in front and they can rush the passer, it becomes a much better defense, right? Mm-hmm. But when they don't have Daquan Jones in there and they don't have the best player, Milano, they're not as good a defense. And so the Patriots, which we've known struggles, I mean, they only were in third down nine times in the game. They were very good on first down. He only had five incomplete passes the entire day. You know, they, I thought they finally did good stuff for Mac. They put him under center. They threw the ball in the middle of the field. They didn't try to throw those stupid nine routes outside. You know, they threw the ball to the tight end. They threw the ball inside the numbers, and they protected. The ball came out of his hand. They had a semblance of a run game, a downhill run game. I thought, you know, for all the problems that they've had, they got them corrected. Now, look, all that being said, if you watch this game closely, Josh Allen is almost impossible to tackle. This guy, I mean, he must have gotten out about nine tackles. It's really remarkable. And keep plays alive. It's really remarkable that he's able to do it. And, you know, you got to give them credit. I mean, you got to give them credit that they fought back. But how about this? The Patriots get 10 first downs in the fourth quarter. 10. Wow. Wow. And, and, I, and I think that's the bigger story with this here because I think a lot of people like – because the easy narrative is like, oh, Josh Allen and the turnovers, and he started the day with the turnover, the interception to Jabril Peppers, I believe it was, and everyone's like, oh, like Josh Allen's being reckless with the football. And, yeah, there's some of that, but the Bills' defense – 
We talked about it a lot after that loss to the Jaguars in London and said, okay, this is a loss, but the bigger loss, the bigger deal is losing Matt Milano and Daquan Jones. And then you add in like the, the, tr the Tredavious White loss and all that stuff. And then yesterday they didn't have Ed Oliver. They were really weak up the middle of that defense there. And I think on the other side, we can have more of this conversation because Buffalo's defense has to improve and improve quickly if they want to compete in this AFC because man, like that, it was a bad performance there. Like this is a New England offense that really couldn't get much going against any opponent. 6.6 .6 yards per play, 364 yards, and they were just efficient all afternoon long. Michael, I want to get your thoughts on that on the other side. We're going to take a quick break here. This is the GM Shuffle. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Michael, something you said a couple weeks ago after that loss to the Jacksonville Jaguars, you said that your heart breaks for Bills fans with the loss of Matt Milano, and I think yesterday we saw as to why. Like, yeah. this Bills defense has a lot of problems. Yeah, they do, and, I, and it's going to be interesting what they do with the trade deadline, you know, because they're going to be a desperate team. I mean, I think they feel like their window's closing. Now, look, with Josh Allen, your window's always going to be open. Mm -hmm. But I do think that today, after losing to New England there and playing a short week with Tampa, I think they'll probably sit there, and I could see them doing something that borders on desperate, not necessarily courageous, and trying to make a move to just get them some semblance of – they're going to have to get some help. I don't know where it's coming from, whether it's to trade for another defensive end or a tackle. I mean, the whole trading deadline is all about whose contract's available and who's going to be a free agent, right? So, you know, can we get this guy in here? Can we make this guy come? You know, are we willing to give up more than the compensatory pick to get a guy in here? It's kind of what, what happened when Von Miller got traded you know, and, and, and those things. So to the Rams, you know, they paid way more than what was compensatory and they ended up winning a Super Bowl because of it. I get the sense Buffalo is going to be a little desperate, but they've got to figure out what is wrong with their team. I mean, look, you know, they're, they're not a man-to-man -man team. And when they get into sub situations like they do, people take advantage of their nickel corner Johnson. I mean, they, uh, Mac Jones missed Douglas for a touchdown on exactly the same play <clears throat> that Gusecki scored a touchdown on. Yeah. They just flopped the personnel. They put Gusecki in the slot and ran the same play. And Johnson can't – I mean, he can't cover – they don't have a man-to-man -man cover guy. So when they got to get a stop, they struggle. What do they rely on? They rely on their rush to stop. But now with their rush not being there and playing from behind as much as they have, they can't create the turnovers – and it's, it's really a problem. I, I just I don't know what Bean and, and McDermott are going to do. They're going to have to figure it out because as of right now, they're not as good as Kansas City nope. in terms of winning the AFC. I think that's pretty clear. You know, could they beat Miami again in Miami? I think it's going to be harder without Daquan Jones inside. I think it's going to be harder, right? I don't think they can dominate physically against Miami. So could they still win the East? Maybe, but I think it's going to be a little harder. You know, there's always going to be a challenge for them. And because of their inability to really get stops when they need to. Look, if you're an elite defense and you're playing against a team that has struggled offensively, you're not giving up 10 first downs in the fourth quarter. You're not giving up 14 points. I mean, they got a break on the fumble, right? I mean, they got it. You know, they made the play on the fumble. Or I think New England's going to get down the field again. I mean, New England only punted twice in a game. Wow. And this was an offense that we talked about having struggles and like they couldn't execute anything. And they, they look like they didn't have any struggles against the Bills defense. And like you mentioned Buffalo, it's like, can they beat the Kansas Cities of the world? Can they beat Baltimore, who looked unbelievable? And we can kind of transition yeah, they, to that, I, that game. That's a good point. Like, I don't think they could beat Baltimore. But think about they're... this, Femi. Yesterday, yesterday they did exactly what I would, would say would be the best thing for them to do. They held the ball for 32 minutes. They played 27 minutes of defense, and yet New England was able to put up 364 yards against them in just 55 plays. New England averaged 6.6 .6 yards per play. That's alarming, right? I mean, when you, what my what's my line? You you want to play good defense, play less defense. Well, they played less defense, and they still couldn't hold the team to under 30, uh, to under 25 points. Yeah. 
That's they got to do something, and we'll we'll talk more trade deadline stuff on Thursday to sort of set the table for that. Like which players might be available, which teams might be active at the trade deadline, which is coming up, I believe, next Tuesday. I think it's on Halloween, either Monday or Tuesday. One of those days is the trade deadline. I believe it's a Tuesday, but uh, I, I'm curious to see to get your thoughts on which guys might be available and the teams that might be going after them because Buffalo feels like they would be chief among them among those teams that thinks that they're contending this season but <clears throat> excuse me but needs a little bit of help to go over the top let's talk about the baltimore ravens though because they mm. absolutely destroyed the detroit lions 38 to 6 9.1 yards per play offensively 503 yards lamar jackson was damn near perfect yesterday 21 of 27 357 passing yards three touchdowns this is the ravens offense that i guess that they were telling us about all offseason with todd munkin and the crew and man they really uh played their best game 99th percentile type of game yesterday Yesterday afternoon against Detroit. I think one of the things that haven't been talked enough about was how good Lamar played last week mm -hmm. in London, how good he was in that game. And that game shouldn't have been close in terms of the cover. He was sensational. You know, and I, I said this on the pod on Thursday. He's had the lowest percentage of bad throws in his career. He's had way too many drops this year than he ever did. He's been on target. I mean, he is he's playing, he's the MVP of the league right now because he's playing at a whole other level than he's ever played before in his career, really, in all honesty. I mean, this mm. is – remember, when he won the MVP, he wasn't throwing for a lot of yards. Now he can throw the football well. I think he's always thrown the football well. But they're throwing the ball in the middle of the field, which is what I've always said they need to do. And he's making a ton – and he's putting the ball accurately there. I mean, they had 503 yards of offense yesterday, Femi. Yeah. So, I mean, look – I give them credit. They were sensational. And he's really been the difference in these receivers. I mean, they start the game off with four touchdowns. I mean, Detroit couldn't get control of the game. And I don't know. You know, it was interesting. Detroit didn't practice on Wednesday. And, I mean, I loved Baltimore all week. And I didn't take them in Russo because I wanted Russo to take the Lions. Right? I wanted Russo to take the Lions because I like Baltimore. So it would have given me an extra win. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So if I took Baltimore, then I had to win the bet, and then he could come out of it. But I was counting on him taking Detroit, and then I would have just laid off it. So I didn't take Baltimore in our contest. I took the Chargers, which is a whole other story. Yeah. But which is stupid on my part. As you guys are doing game now. theory out there with Russo. <laughs> well, yeah, you have to yeah. because now I could, if he takes a team, I could take an, I could take the opposite and, yeah. and double whammy it. But it's so early in the season, there's no reason to do it. So I was assuming he was going to take Balt, going to take Detroit because he's been winning with Detroit every week, and he didn't, you know. And I laid off Baltimore, but I thought it was this game was. In fact, Bill Berman over here, he was like. You know, Baltimore, the Detroit, and we had to put it up on the board on Friday afternoon. You know, the, Detroit's going to win. You know, now it's up there on my board as one of his blunders. But anyway, uh, I, I just felt like Detroit Wednesday, they didn't practice, Femi. They canceled like they, they had a walkthrough or something. Like, to me, when you do that on a week when you're playing a big game and you're Dan Campbell and you're a macho, tough guy, you're probably – your team's beat up and you just want to rest your team. That, that was a concern for me. Yeah, and, and they were beat up all about throughout this game here. Like they, the, the Ravens from start to finish just moved down the field and they showed that the first four drives is just touchdown, 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 touchdown. And after that point, it was over. And like we talked obviously a lot about this Ravens offense. Their defense was spectacular in that game as well. Like kudos to Mike McDonald, their defensive coordinator. We haven't talked much about him uh, throughout his tenure there as, as the, the Ravens uh, DC, but they just had – all the answers for what Detroit typically does there. And Detroit just could not move the ball. Like they, the Ravens got pressure. Shout out Jadavian Clowney, who, who's, who's being disruptive on this Baltimore Ravens front. Like it was a really good defense. And this is a defense that when you look at all the advanced metrics shows that they are in the elite class. So if you get elite defensive play to go along with what Lamar is doing, like this Ravens team, like, like when the dust is settled, like we might be talking about them as a one or a two seed in the AFC. No, no question. No, they, and they deserve it. I mean, look, and the other thing, remember, this whole show really is about cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. So the Lions, when they can't run the ball, or if they get behind in games and have to run a drop-back pass game, they don't have one. We've said that about Goff for years, right? He got sacked five times yesterday, right? And he's got to put it up 53 times. You get behind 28 nothing, the game goes not the way you want it to go. So for me, it was like that's where – when you can change the way the other team has to play through your offense, which is what Buffalo had done, 
which is what now Baltimore's doing, which plays into the strength. Baltimore's finally healthy, though, too, right? Mm-hmm. Early in the year, they weren't healthy. When the Colts beat them there, they weren't healthy. They were they had so many guys on the injured list. But you're right. I think they, they certainly belong in the conversation. And Lamar's MVP odds should go way down because he is, you know, I know there's all this Tua talk about being the MVP, but I'm just telling you, the best player right now in football is Lamar. Well, the MVP talk has changed to the reigning MVP being Patrick Mahomes. Uh, right now at our yeah. show sponsor, DraftKings, Mahomes is the favorite, plus 275. Two is still at 4-1. to one. Jalen Hurts, 5-1. to one. Lamar is at 7-1 to one right now, so he is fourth on the odds board for MVP. Mahomes had his best game, his most productive game offensively yesterday against the Los Angeles Chargers. 32 of 42, 424 yards, four touchdowns, one interception. Chiefs beat the Chargers 31-17 and uh, probably putting a final nail in the coffin in the AFC West, at least as we see it. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I don't know what, what to say. We know Herbert. I think Herbert's one of the worst quarterbacks in the second half in terms of covering the spread that you'll ever see. They can't hold the lead. You know, I think they're 7-24-2 and two against the spread when having the lead at halftime. Right? You know, and so they, they score 17 points in the first half. They can't score another point the rest of the game. I mean, now you can say, you know, they they only held, they held the Chiefs to seven points in the second half. They had ample opportunities, Femi. Mm-hmm. But you know, I I was on the Chargers, and what bothered me about this game, and I is I went through it, I t- broke it down, and I'm like, these are always close games, and the numbers proved it out, right? Yep. And they play well back there, but it none of that proved out because Kansas City really took the game over, and if it wasn't for Kansas City's uh, turnovers, it probably would have been a bigger score. I, I, I was always nervous. I don't know how you feel about this, but when so much of the public money was on Kansas, it was on the Chargers, that made me nervous. Like everybody was betting the Chargers, the line never moved. Yeah. I mean, it felt like one of those games to where people were like, oh, it's always a close game when these two teams play, getting Herbert. Because also, Herbert is a, as a quarterback is always going to be attractive. If you can get six points or five and a half points, people are going to kind of gravitate towards that. But We also got to look at this Chargers defense and how they've been playing so far. It's just been bad, and it feels like it's getting worse. 7.5 yards per play for Kansas City, 483 yards. This is the Chiefs' offense that hasn't been really explosive all season, and they had their breakout performance yesterday. I mean, was somebody going to say to Brendan, to Staley, maybe you might want to cover Kelsey? I know know Taylor was there, but, I mean, I, I guess it's against the rules if she's in the stadium to cover him. Like, we're just going to let him run free? Like, I liked – Derwin James usually covers them, but obviously yeah. they decided not to cover them. Think about this, though. And I'll leave them before we go to break. The Chargers, when they allow 27 more points, are 6-23. and 23. When they allow less than 27, they're 25-5. and five. It's a goddamn good thing they hired a defensive coach. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really great thing that they hired them. Uh, they got to make a change. And I think it's more of a, a question of when, not if. And we'll see that in the future here. But the Chiefs beat the Chargers 31-17. We'll wrap things up on the other side. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi. Presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. All right, let's get a few quick hitters here before we get to the awards. Uh, were the text messages flowing yesterday, Michael, from Big Daddy? Oh, I got them, yeah. You, you, you oh, got the man, text messages him, yeah. from Big Daddy? Well, Did- no, I wasn't getting them. I was kind of disappointed. He was not, you know, I gave him the Sunday ticket. And <laughs> so, I, 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 and you know, and so, like, I love this. So I told him Stokes was going to be dressed for the game. And, of course, he's been anti-Stokes his whole career. He's anti-anybody they draft. I was going to say. So, and I love this. He always is, let's see how it goes. You know, it's like that's one of his favorite lines. Let's see how, he, let's see how it goes. Like, even when he's, like, when he's doubtful, you know, he's like he's going to take a negative position. So, anyway, I got, a, I, I got this text last night at 837. I'm watching the, the, the game on the, the Eagle game. Yo. Really bad game by Packers today. They looked awful. This team is either devoid of talent or the coaching is off awful. Either regime change needs to happen from Murphy on down. I said, so how did Jordan Love play? He, awful in the first half, decent in the second. They had their chances late, and he couldn't make it happen. Alexander is hurt. Savage is hurt. And your boy Stokes was never on the field. Why? 
I, I didn't have an answer for him. I mean, you I know, he, he got, got a hurt break again. too. Did did you think that touchdown was a touchdown? Like the, I thought they were. I thought it was an interception. The I simul- thought Sertan intercepted it. Yeah, the simultaneous catch. I mean, they always lean towards the offense. Ty goes to the runner kind of thing. But I, I think Packer fans have have had enough of simultaneous catches after the fail Mary from a decade ago against Seattle. There, so it's good to see one finally go in their favor. But um, I guess they're always going to give it to the offense. You know, we got to get scoring up, Michaels. That's why you saw all the illegal contact stuff going. We we can't have the discussion be about how offenses are bad these days. Here's what bothers me about the Packers. I think they have a really good front. I think when you break their front down, you know, Clark's a good player. You know, Preston Smith does some good things. Walker's a good player, right? You know, Rashard Gary's a really good player. They bring the kid from South Carolina, 55 off the bench. Mm -hmm. He's a good player. Like, their front's pretty good. They're stout. But they can't play the run against anybody. Of course, they play the run good against the Raiders, but that's a whole other story. But to me... You know, they just they, they they give up 145 yards rushing to Denver. And you know Denver, if Denver can run the ball, they're going to do that, right? They're going to want to run it and take clock off. They don't want to play defense, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and that's what they did. The Packers ended up having the ball for 31 minutes and still couldn't do anything with it. it was, I mean, but, yeah. it, it's it's bad. I, I, I can't really disagree with – like I'm not saying they should make a regime change, but they're grow Jordan Love. I mean, they got to ask himself the question: Are they good enough? But my question is this: Look what Schwartz has done for Cleveland's defense. I, I don't understand why Green Bay's defense is what they are. I mean, it's a good thing the the Broncos were one for four in the red zone. Mm. Think about it. I mean, the the Broncos were one for four in the red zone. They had many opportunities. They had to kick three field four field goals. Or else this game isn't close. Yeah, it's uh, you. You'd want to see a little bit more from the Green Bay's offense. Like I just see on the offense, there's a lack of explosive plays. Like, everything is a screen. Everything's a check down. They just don't really have any. And like you have Christian Watson back, he's healthy. You got Aaron yeah. Jones back for this game. This is the guy yeah, that they've been I, saying is their best offensive player, and they can't get anything. I think explosive. a lot of this too, Femi, is like like you watched the Raider game yesterday. There's the Raiders' longest pass play was 15 yards against the Bears, which you can't run the ball against the Bears. You got to throw it because the Bears secondary. They're gonna they're a zone team, whether it's cover two, cover three. There's a lot of throws to make, but when your longest throw is 15 yards, who you beating? You don't make any chuck snap plays down the field. Yeah. Like you got to make you know you got to have drive starters. You got to have plays that start drive and get 20 yards. You know, I mean, it's one of the biggest plays in football that no one talks about. The Raiders hand the ball off for three yards on first down. You know, and then they're second and seven. And then when they, you know, they can't convert a third down. So you're playing into it. I mean, Josh used to be a really good CFL play caller. He used to call second down. We'll get first downs and two downs. They've stopped doing that. I think a lot of this comes back to, and I'm not making excuses because I'm yelling at the TV just like any Raider fan would too, is I think a lot of it is they're protecting the quarterback. They don't want the quarterback to hurt him. And you know what happens when you do that? He kills you anyway. Yep. I, I, the best way for me to protect the quarterback is to actually get, pass on early Throw downs. the ball on first yes, down. Throw it on first. It's the best down to throw yeah. it on. Yeah. I mean, you know, throw it on first down. Get him into – like what, yesterday when you can get into a rhythm where if you can lock him into a formational group where you know they're going to be a vanilla and, and throw it out of that. Like if, if I'm playing the Bears, I'm throwing it 45 times. I'm going to throw it. Now, I know you have Hoyer playing quarterback, which is a whole other story. But the reality of it is, is you got to throw it. You got to make chunk plays down the field. How about the Steelers Rams game where I was a Steelers better and for about two hours of watching that game, I was like, there's no chance I'm going to win this bet. But it felt like a classic situation of the Rams in the first half controlling the game, but letting a team hang around. And then here comes Pittsburgh. TJ Watt always makes a play. And that interception at the beginning of the first, uh, second half rather, is what really changed this game. And Pittsburgh dominated them in the fourth quarter and they get a win 42, or sorry, uh, to improve the 4 and 2, 24 17, beating LA. I mean, Pittsburgh's resilient, right? Yeah. And, and for all the bullshit, all the talk about how bad Pickett is, I mean, Pickett does what they need him to do is manage the game. You know, and he's got a connection with Pickens. And I said this on the pod, having Johnson back, I said on the show on Sunday, I thought that was going to be huge for them because it'll take some of the pressure off Pickens. And look, let's face it, this Ram team, I was surprised they ran the ball as effectively as they did. They ran for 135 in the game. But the longer the game goes, the more physicality they have to face, the less effective they become. And look, they might win this game, 
I mean, that quarterback sneak, there's no way. I don't know where that official spotted no. the ball to give him the first down. I have I, no idea. But in fairness, the, the Steelers got the Steelers had 25 plays in the fourth quarter. 25 plays in the fourth quarter. And, and they got 11 first downs. They wear you down. Yeah. 191 yards of offense after pretty much doing nothing offensively for the first three quarters 191 yards of offense 14 points in the fourth quarter I think wearing down is, is the perfect phrase to use because we also saw Stafford as well who looked a little bit sharper in the first half once that pressure continued to come you can you, see he'd get a little bit rattled and started to lose the accuracy I was all over the Steelers in this game I did, I gave it out as one of my plays I took it in Russo uh unfortunately I took the Chargers in Russo and I took Seattle in Russo and covered barely covered that because Gino was trying to give him the game away that should have been an easy cover. Should it wasn't. Been, yeah. But but at least I was 2-1 and one in the Russo contest. I gave this one out in terms of my VEASAN picks. For me, it was, you know, I, I just feel like the, the Steeler team is undervalued because everybody picks on Pickett, and there's three dimensions to the game, right? And Pickett, Watts, this Ram team is not good up front. I mean, you can physically. Now, I was surprised that they were able to run the football effectively on them. But, you know, they did, and it still didn't matter. Last game, do you want to hit on here? Uh, Falcons and the Buccaneers. I mean, this was a game that was out there for the taking for either team. Atlanta ended up winning it 16-13, to 13, last second field goal by Young Way Koo there. But, boy, the QB play. We talk about double agents. I think both guys, uh, Ritter and Mayfield, were double agents in this contest. Well, I mean, Ritter's turned the ball over four times inside the 12 in the last two weeks. You know, and, and three of them were fumbles. I mean, I think all of them are fumbles. Right? Yep. I mean, the, the fumble he has going in to put the game away. The, first of all, let me be clear. This game should not have been close. The Falcons were the better team, and Ritter's three fumbles kept him in the game. You know, one time was on a quarterback sneak, but the one that he kept the ball in his right hand and it got knocked out. I mean, I'm watching the game with Corey. I gave out it. I liked Atlanta on the show that day, and I really liked Atlanta all week because I, I think Ritter's taken too much hit it's for I think he's really improved as a passer. I really do. I think he's improved as a passer. You know, he's 19 for 25 yesterday for 250. Didn't throw a pick. You know, they they can really move the. They were moving the football against a good Buck defense, and you had to throw the ball to do it. But they were one for five in the red zone because they kept turning the goddamn thing over with fumbles. Yeah. And I mean, to me, so I'm watching the game, Femi, and I see him go in for the touchdown, and then the next thing I know, we Corey and I look at each other like. Wait a minute, why, is, why didn't they put the score on the scoreboard? And then he literally had to go through his phone because I was watching some other game and tell me, oh, they, they, he fumbled it out of bounds. Can't happen. I mean, that. that was one of the worst plays I've ever seen by a player. Yeah, and, and the quarterback should know that too. Like, ball should be on the outside arm so that they can't come and get, like, it's just classic fundamental stuff there, and, like, you just can't fumble the football in that spot being a touchback. Buccaneers almost had a chance to steal the game, but Atlanta held on. All right, let's get to the awards. The Fred Palermo best game plan of the week goes to? Well, I think you got to give it to New England. I mean, look, they, they, I never thought New England could win this game. I was pretty clear about that. I mean, I, I mean, based on history and based on the way they've played Buffalo the last few times and the way they're playing – I, I didn't think they had a chance in hell to win it, and they broke the Bills' curse. So you got to give them credit. I thought they did a really good job offensively. They were in a lot of bunches. They threw the ball on first down. They didn't try to, you know, they got ahead of the change. They got a lead. I thought they did a really good job. Who's going on the lamb this week? Well, I mean, the Raiders played horribly yesterday. There's no denying it. I mean, I think everybody has to admit that to move forward. I mean, they were lethargic. They, they let a, a kid from Shepherd College – you know, come down and complete one of the worst tackling performances I've seen by a team all year, the Raiders yesterday on defense. And then offensively, I'm not sure what they were trying to get done, but, you know, they, they, they played into the strength of the Bears, which if they have any, it's their front. And then I think Washington. I mean, Washington oh. ha, is just at some point, you, you know, at some point you got to figure out what the hell are you doing. Uh, you know, they run, they get the, they're going to get the quarterback. He's six, six more times. Yep. He's sacked, you know, and – and it doesn't stop them. Their offensive line, in fairness to be enemy, I'm picking on his play calling, but in fairness to be enemy, it's hard to call plays with that offensive line as bad as it is. Sam Howell you has not and, and, and think about this. The Giants score with seven minutes to go in the second quarter and don't score another point after that. And basically get – I think they got five first downs from that point forward. Hold on, I got it in my – yeah, they got five first downs from that and the seven total after they scored. 
and the Washington gets Washington gets nine first downs in the fourth quarter, and they don't score a point because they fumble. Uh, they pick up the fumble, and they miss a field goal by. I mean, they missed a chip shot field goal. The play of the game. I don't know if you saw it, Femi. Was McLaurin catches a ball and he barely got his helmet touched, or else it was a touchdown. We we're going to go and tie. The uh, Sam Howell has not been sacked 40 times so far through seven games. There's there's 10 more games to go. He's been sacked 40 times. Uh, the fraud, fraud of the week. You got to give it to the Browns defense. I mean, they just gave up too many yards rushing. If you don't know, now you know. The West is the we've just crowned the Chiefs the AFC West champions. They'll be the number one or number two seed. Thank you for playing, everybody else. Yep. Hats and t-shirts, hand them out. And then it is what it is. Defensive lines will always dominate. Take a defensive lineman in every round. That's Utopia. Who wins tonight? Niners at the Vikings, Monday Night Football. I think the Niners win. I would take the points. I'm rooting for Minnesota to cover. Please, please, please. Russo took Minnesota. <laughs> that does it for us on the pod. Thank you to our producer, Elliot Bowman, on the ones and twos. Thank you to DraftKings. Thank you to Vison. Thank you to you, Michael. We will break it all down and set the trade deadline table on Thursday. We'll see you guys then. <laughs>